Mark Rogers TV, voice of college football, coming your way with some Miami talk on a Thursday night. We are nine days away from most of the teams playing next Saturday. We are just a week away from uh, some Power 5 teams getting on the field for the first time. We are just a couple days away, meaning two from some FCS and group of fives playing. But we we talk Miami, LSU. We're, of course, 10 days away with the special Sunday night edition of college football that opening weekend with the Tigers taking on the Canes. We got Cam Underwood on the line from State of the U. Cam, how you doing tonight? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, you know, 10 days away from the kickoff of this season that we've been looking for for a long time. So downhill towards, uh, you know, not just talking about football, but having real live football. I'm excited. Yeah, the anticipation is just crazy. Because uh, I know you like the NBA, you like other sports, but it seems like they just shut down and then you blink and you turn around and they're back in uh, camp. But with college football, it just seems like forever. And we've been talking and talking and talking and talking about last season and going over and reviewing it a zillion times, plus trying to project what's going to happen this year. We will finally have a game of fresh play activity, action on the field to analyze. And that's going to be so much fun. And it's a meaningful, meaningful game obviously for both teams, as we have two very talented teams going at it. So uh, your impressions of what uh, you have seen and heard and read and uh, reported on from Kane's camp recently. Yeah, you know, the team has a lot of talent this year. So I know that we lost a lot of guys, but there's a lot of talent to like. The skill position talent obviously is going um, some of the best skill position talent that you'll find on any roster in America. Excuse me. Um, linebacking core is, you know, top three in America. Defensive line, while has new names that, uh, you know, are going to replace some of the veteran contributors. There are, you know, good players there. Secondary has good players there, you know, but some unproven talent, but a lot of talent there anyway, even if it hasn't been proven at this level. Um, and a quarterback who at his peak is, you know, very, very good, but at the Valley is very, very bad. Um, and inconsistent at best. So um, that's something that's going to need to obviously uh, change, you know, uh, stable of running backs. There, there's a lot of things to like. So, you know, the team is going, uh, is working hard, you know, getting towards the season. The the Canes camp is now over because, you know, we're in uh, basically into season mode now. Uh, just got the media schedule for this next upcoming week. And yeah, I mean, we're in game week mode already. So I think that, you know, um, practices or, you know, we're going to hear from players and coaches on things like Tuesdays and Wednesdays this week, um, upcoming and then after the game. So like, yeah, we're, you know, in full game mode and, you know, everything is, is going in that proper way. Of course, you know, you got a couple injuries during Kane's camp, uh, to reshuffle a couple of things. Um, you know, Michael Irvin, the second starting tight end or the number one tight end coming into the fall or into camp. He uh, hurt his knee, so he's out for at least four months after surgery. So Brevin Jordan is now at the top of the position group, but that was something that I've spoken about expecting for a long time. So it just kind of sped up that process, and you never want to see it uh, or hear about an injury. So that was one thing. Uh, LSU transfer George Brown Jr. Um, hurt his knee, and he's out for an undisclosed amount of time. Um, and obviously he's going to probably miss the LSU game, which for him I'm sure is impactful because – he went to LSU, left LSU and came to Miami. So you circle that for, you know, a couple years down the line. Like, hey, I'm going to play against the guys, you know, that I, you know, want to share a locker room with. And then, you know, yeah, you have that kind of injury. Um, and then just a couple, you know, nicks and dings. Uh, you know, you have guys missing, you know, a day here, a day there. Uh, Michael Pinckney missed like a day of practice a couple weeks ago. Trajan Bandy uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, Joe Jackson. Uh, had like a preliminary or a precautionary elbow um, brace thing. Um, he was not demoted, but uh, he was working with the third team. Joe Jackson was uh, for a couple of days just to kind of be precautionary about his uh, elbow. And then he's back as a full go participant in practice recently. So, you know, a lot of things like that. Um, but yeah, just hearing good things about the freshmen. And, uh, you know, Mark Rick said that a bunch of freshmen are going to play um, like base offense and defense snaps against LSU. So not just special teams, although that's a place where I expect to see freshman play as well. So, you know, it's just kind of your normal camp. You, you see guys redefining their bodies. You see guys redefining um, roles or finding new roles for themselves on the team. Um, you know, like a Treon Gray, a Chalk Gray, who was a high school quarterback at Miami Carroll City, um, 
arguably one of the fastest guys on the team at six foot two, six three, like two thirty five, two forty. He's a big dude, so he's playing fullback, and all of a sudden, you know, he's up to the number three running back slot. And honestly, I didn't think he was going to really play running back here ever again. Um, but yeah, he, he's redefined himself. He's come out as a fifth year senior, and he's working hard. So you know, just a lot of things like that. Um, and I'm really interested to see how, you know, when things are, are fully settled across the board, who really, you know, it, in the music world or in the band world, we call it uh, tree shaking, where you go and you, you kind of shake the tree and see what stays and see what falls. And yeah, we need a tree shaking, you know, that LSU game, we're going to see, okay, like, yeah, we've heard about this kind of thing. And I talked about this on the radio today. It's a great indicator in practice, what's happening and hearing from the players and coaches. But you can only trust that in so far because it's against your teammates. It's under, you know, the watchful eye of your coaches and things like that. When you're now going against another team of scholarship players, then you're going to really find out really where things shake. So I think that Miami's in a good spot. I do like where the roster is. I do like where the um, the chatter is from everybody, from players to coaches. Uh but, you know, obviously this is a time for optimism. So, you know, I want to see uh, what happens on the field. And I think that everybody's really excited for September 2nd. A lot of hey, hellos to Cam and myself. A lot of score predictions and uh, Miami uh, record predictions on the chat. Uh, final scrimmage uh, just in the last uh, 24 hours, Cam. Uh, the As you mentioned to me before we started to record, the third of three is in the books. Um, anything that we can glean from the uh, various scrimmages and especially this uh, last one? Yeah, um, you know, just really that there are playmakers on this team. Um, on offense and defense, there's a lot of speed. Um, this last scrimmage, uh, Miami put the ones on the same team. So first team offense, first team defense against the best of the rest is what they called it. Uh, and the best of the rest were LSU. And it was, you know, the typical come from behind scenario. So uh, the coaches spotted the second team or the, the fake LSU team, 27 nothing lead, and then put situations together um, for the first team and everything. And I mean, it wasn't perfect, but, you know, um, Malik Rozier led a final drive uh, and he threw a touchdown pass to Amon Richards uh, for the, the win in that one. So I think the starters won 28-27 from what was uh, told to us because obviously scrimmages are closed. So we just kind of heard uh, what Mark Rick told to, to the media. So, yeah, you know, um, just just players making plays. Um, Michael Jackson or Sheldrick Redwine, excuse me, had an interception in that game. Javante Dean, who's a, a Juco transfer in his last year here at Miami, finally starting to put together his athletic gifts with demonstrable skill uh, at 6'2", and he's clocked to sub 4'4", 4, 440. Um, Javante Dean has all the tools in the world, but last year he was just inconsistent with his technique, really kind of floundering in the system. But he seems to now be streamlining that and his knowledge and his production really coming together. So that was a big thing that I wanted to see and hear about. Uh, Trajan Bandy, uh, you know, he of the pick six against Notre Dame, uh, is really stepping his game up. No, he's not the biggest cornerback at five foot nine, but right now he's at a starting outside uh, cornerback slot when Miami has four defensive backs uh, opposite Michael Jackson. And then Bandy slides to the slot, and then Dean comes in as the third corner uh, in like a nickel package. So, um, you know, Bandy having that flexibility and, you know, just really great demonstrable skills. So, you know, those kind of things are, are really great to hear. Um, and just on top of that, being mostly healthy. Um, obviously, you know, I spoke about a couple of nicks and things. I mean, it's football practice is a collision sport. You're going to have some of those things, even with being as careful, quote unquote, as you can. Um, and, you know, Michael uh, Irvin, the second and George Brown, Jr., you know, obviously having uh, knee issues or um, injuries that, you know, did require some kind of time off. But yeah, otherwise, you know, you, you're mostly healthy. That's, you know. Starting quarterback, Malik Rozier, healthy. Starting running back, Travis Homer, healthy. Amon Richards, one of the best wide receivers in all of America, finally back healthy. And if you remember, he hurt his hamstring in last year's fall camp, and that plagued him all the way throughout the year because the hamstring is one of the largest muscle groups in your body. And, I mean, you use it with every single step. And once that thing is pulled and whatever, you know, it it just continues to, to snowball. So you don't have any of those kind of things. I mean, you know, you just – Really, really a great camp 
from an injury standpoint. Not perfect, obviously. But, yeah, I mean, Miami's in a really good spot, uh, you know, working hard. And now we're just really going downhill towards the season. And like I said, you know, it's time to shake the tree and see uh, what uh, what rises or what stays and what falls. But, yeah, we're in a good spot. So we all know from watching LSU for a number of years that they always wear the white they they have not worn purple uniforms, basically. I'm sure they have once or twice. But basically, the deal is, is that traditionally teams wear dark uniforms at home and therefore they need to wear the white on the road. But LSU switches it around. So they always choose white because if they're at home, they've got the white. Then they wear the road whites because the other team has chosen to wear the dark jersey. So that that gives me a picture of what the game's going to look like on the TV screen and you're going to be right there in the stadium cam so the do we know if the canes go with the green or go with the orange and do you have a preference oh yeah no that's a, a great question uh, my or LSU does traditionally wear white at home uh, in Death Valley, and they they petitioned for that. Uh, there was a couple years ago, I think it was Oregon State or somebody random went down there, and they were like, no, 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 no we're going to wear white. And for like a night game in LSU, which is like unheard of, uh, but they do have to petition the other team for that. Uh, and the other team, they were, you know, being jerks. Hey, let's do it. Um, and they said, no, you can't, you know, we're going to not, you know, let you have your tradition because we don't have to. Uh, but for the opener in uh, Arlington, Texas, at Jerry Jones World, I, or AKA uh, AT&T Stadium, uh, the Miami Hurricanes are actually going orange over white. And uh, there is a new alternate jersey, actually. And I wrote about this this week on State of the U. Um, Adidas has partnered with a company called Parley for the Oceans. Um, and they're making jerseys from upcycled ocean um, waste. So like plastic from the oceans uh, being taken and then repurposed. Uh, and they're really actually kind of slick. So if you look at the numbers of the jerseys, the the threading or the detailing is like what Parley is known for. They have this uh, kind of ocean blue uh, and white colorway that they do across all their engagements. That is their that is their thing. Um, so you see some of that detailing, like on the side, there's a, a subliminal shadow of like a, a palm tree and things like that. There's like orange cap sleeve kind of a thing. Uh, sorry, green cap sleeves on the orange jersey. Excuse me. Um, there are, and the thing that started to tip people off is um, Adidas and Parley have partnered for uh, different shoes and things like that. And actually somebody asked me randomly, hey, can you talk about shoes for the season? Because I need a new pair. And I included the Parley uh, uh, Ultra Boosts in there, which have that same, you know, traditional colorway of that white and seafoam blue. Um, and yeah, Miami players were wearing cleats in that same colorway. And it kind of looks like almost dolphins aqua blue if you will so a bunch of people were like hey why are we wearing these cleats this is different maybe there's an alternate uniform and you know adidas said when they signed miami to uh, the apparel deal that they were going to make miami the premium or premier team for their uh design and their jersey tech and all these different kind of things so yeah you do have these um i think they're called defenders of the deep alternate jerseys um and yeah, it's pretty cool. And I think actually on Monday, the 27th, uh, the University of Miami is going to put those jerseys up for auction uh, as well with the proceeds going to uh, the uh, University of Miami Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science, which is a world renowned school uh, for marine biology and marine sciences uh, to, you know, do research on helping the oceans and, you know, all these different kind of things. So uh, you have the, the cleats and the jerseys and everything, you know, in that partnership with Parley and Adidas, which is really pretty cool. So, uh, yeah, we, uh, we're, Miami's going to have, you know, orange alternates with, you know, orange or green details and then the other, the Parley uh, detailing on the numbers and things like that for the opener. So it's, uh, you know, I, I was thinking from when I initially saw the, uh, the cleats a couple months ago that it was going to be more of like a, if you think of like the LeBron 11s, kind of like a, or the, the Miami Heat South Beach uniforms, you know, kind of pink and green and things like that. I, that's what I had in my mind's eye. So when I finally was able to see the jerseys a couple days before they released, it was a little different. So I was kind of taken aback. But the more I look at them, I, it's really a sleek design. It's really cool. And plus the fact, you know, it is a, for a good cause, you know, like saving the oceans and, you know, kind of curtailing some of the, the waste uh, in everything. Because, you know, if you don't know, and I mean, I'm not going to be on my soapbox, but like, you know, 
the earth is made like 70 percent out of water man so like these are things that matter to everybody and especially being here uh, in south florida and being you know very close to the coast and everything like you know the coastline and the oceans like you know i mean these are things that matter maybe a little bit more to me and where i live than some other people but you know uh, you know having that combination that uh, collaboration between all adidas and parley for the new jerseys is pretty cool so like i said i wrote about it up on the state of the U, and you can go on there and check it out with some really really great photos and information yeah, I saw the news drop on the uniform selection and the whole process and, and what it means. And uh, I was just thinking uh, what a process it must be to be a company, want to sell your jerseys or your uh, gear to a particular college football program of that magnitude. I wonder what the process is of of uh, presenting that, presenting your pitch, the 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 fabric, having all that looked at and reviewed and, and the, the cost portion of it and all of that reviewed and, 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 um, taken into account and, and accepted and, and the deal done must be some kind of process there. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, there, there's a lot that goes into that kind of thing. And, um, you know, there, are, you know, Miami's probably, you know, obviously has a rep from Adidas, but you know, you're going to have some of the higher ups at the company who are really doing those kind of things. And, you know, having met a lot of people who work for Adidas over the years and, you know, from a variety of things and, you know, just seeing a lot of the different designs over years, you know, like, yeah, when Miami first went over to Adidas, uh, you know, people were talking about that look like the feathers on the, uh, arms of the jerseys and that was like supposed to be like a hurricane swirl and you take that and then you purpose that onto the jersey and, you know, uh, it, I mean, I liked them. It wasn't the best jersey ever, but, you know, yeah, um, I think Adidas overall has really tightened up their design of jerseys. And I know that years ago, you know, everybody made fun of every Adidas jersey. But, I mean, if you look at the the Defenders of the Deep, I think, what, the Adidas and Parley Prime Knit A1 jersey, I think, is the official title. Man, it's a great design. So, uh, yeah, you know, it's pretty cool. And like I said, you know, Miami is a premium program. It is a national brand. And Adidas is really partnered with uh, Miami and put Miami at the forefront of the technology and design element for the company and their partnerships. And we're seeing that right now because, you know, there are other Adidas schools and there are even a couple of schools who have a more lucrative contract than Miami does who signed it after Miami and things like that. But those schools didn't get the alternates for the opener. They didn't get this parley coordination. They didn't get this collaboration. The University of Miami did because of the, you know, the strength of the brand across the board. So, yeah, I'm sure that it was an intensive process and these have been in the works for months, um, but it's pretty cool to see. So I'm glad, you know, to, to have that. And they will look really, really great on television come September 2nd. Cam Underwood, State of the U, joining us to talk Miami football with us uh, 10 days away from the LSU opener. Uh, a number of comments on the live chat about the uh, uniforms, nothing in particular that stands out, except for Terry King, who mentions that Miami could beat LSU even if they were naked. <laughs> I love the enthusiasm. Yeah, I mean, Miami's in a good spot for this game, I think, uh, and everything. Uh, just a couple minutes before I came on here, I saw that Ross Dellinger from Sports Illustrated reported that uh, Christian Fulton, who was a five-star cornerback uh, signee with LSU a couple years ago, um, is being reinstated. Um, and he had a – Fulton got a two-year penalty for, um, like, failing a drug test and, like, tampering with it, they said. Um, but – the genesis of like the appeal process was no, he substituted a urine sample, which is a one year penalty, not tampering with a sample, which is a two year penalty where he cannot play. Um, but yeah, it was kind of going back and forth with the NCAA where he was, uh, his uh, appeal was initially denied. So he was going to miss a second consecutive year. And I think this is after a redshirt year. So he hasn't played in like two or three years. Um, but like I said, right before I, I sat down to record this, I saw, like I said, from Sports Illustrated, uh, Ross Dellinger, that Christian Fulton is going to be reinstated. Uh, so that gives um, LSU another talented player uh, who is available for the game and things like that. I mean, not that LSU is really hurting for uh, talent because they do recruit very well and they have a very talented team. But adding Fulton will be a, excuse me, a good addition for them. But with or without Fulton, I think that Miami's in a good spot. I've said it on here, and I've wrote, written it on stateoftheu.com, you know, the website that, you know, I've been managing for a couple of years now. Um, but, uh, yeah, if Miami comes out and does what Miami needs to do, then, you know, I'm fairly confident that Miami should be victorious. Speaking of the powers that be in that situation and then in others, 
uh, and a similar situation in re regards to off the field and legalities coming into it and enforcement and authority and discipline and right and wrong and all of that. Just curious as to whether any of the message boards are lighting up there at Miami concerning Urban Meyer, because regardless of who you root for, it's one of the biggest uh, stories we've seen in college football in a long, 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 long time because of the subject matter and because of the success of the coach. Uh, just anything there that uh, that uh, Miami fans are either poking fun at or uh, a lot of programs across the country have stated that they're internalizing the the um, the situation or the story and just to make sure that they have their their process in order uh, if they would have to be faced with that kind of situation. Yeah, um, obviously, you know, um, domestic violence and the allegations against Zach Smith are no laughing matter. So I'm not going to sit here and, and make any jokes um, about that because it's, there's nothing funny about that at all. Um, in similar situations, um, Miami has removed players from the roster um, who had uh, domestic violence or sexual assault um, allegations in the past, Jawand Blue and Eddie Johnson being linebackers who were kicked off the team for such uh, allegations previously. Um, and that's a thing that, you know, for Miami, uh, we've treated very seriously um, for a long time. And that is a thing about which, I mean, I'm not happy that it happens in Miami, but the response has been swift and it's been decisive. Um, insofar as Urban Meyer, and especially with the report of the investigation that was released after the um, findings or whatever was announced. Um, well, first of all, the press conference was disgusting. Um, to act as the victim for Urban Meyer in that situation is just absolutely disgusting. Um, it was not about you uh, or anything. It was about Courtney Smith and what was sent and said and all these different kind of things. Didn't even mention her name one time. Had to be, uh, you know, asked directly about that to put himself in the situation. Say it's a you know a shame that we are in this situation. You're not a victim of anything. So please stop that. Um, the entire situation really insulted everyone's intelligence, anyone's intelligence. There's no rational person who believes these things. Urban Meyer and his wife are legendarily close. It has been written about, it's been talked about for, they've been married for almost 30 years. And to sit here and say, and think that it stands to muster that your wife was sent something of the caliber that we've seen because Brett McMurphy reported on because he had the physical text messages to what was sent to Shelly Meyer and then say, oh, I didn't know about my wife's text messages of something of that nature of someone Zach Smith, who you are almost familial with because your his grandfather was your mentor. So you have this close connection to the individual and then on the side who the, the information was sent about and then the very close proximity, obviously, to your, your wife. And to think, okay, well, yeah, it's fine. Well, I just didn't know about that. I can't call that lying because that would be a, that would be libelous and slanderous. So I'm not calling it lying. It does not stand to reason in my estimation. Um, and the the report afterwards, like I was going to say, the 23 page report, which I sat and I went through last night. I'm sorry, my Google Home is uh, acting crazy as I'm talking here. Um, but no reasonable person can read that report and what was in there and come away thinking that urban meyer should have kept his job and as i saw many people say um you know dan wolken uh bomani jones many other journalists myself included uh in there and just other people the only reason that urban meyer has a job is because ohio state did not want to fire him so they did everything that they could to figure out or to come to terms with not firing him. Um, I saw, I think it was Dan Wolken and a couple other journalists. They said, yeah, that's why the meetings took 12 hours yesterday because it took reasonable people that long to come to the decision, uh, serious people to come to a very unserious decision by keeping Urban Meyer there. I think it's disgusting. I think it is atrocious. I think that it is one of the worst things that I've ever seen. Um, and I am from Michigan. I went to Miami. And I mean, for for football reasons and for sporting reasons, I've never seen it for Ohio State. I've never had any love for them. I've never had any co or collegial feeling for them. In a real life way, they disgust me now in a way that even more so than previous. Um, and like I said, I'm not going to make any jokes about the situation because it is very serious uh, and things like that. When you have Shelly Meyer saying to Courtney Smith and reportedly to Urban Meyer, look, 
this guy concerns me. I'm scared of him. I'm scared of Zach Smith and what he might do, not only to her, but to me because of his level of rage or whatever. And know that, but then say, oh, well, yeah, your wife didn't tell you that she might potentially be scared for her personal safety. Like I said, I cannot call that lying because I cannot do that. It does not stand to reason. I do not believe what it is that he said. And the entire enterprise of Ohio State University, the decision that they made and the consequences that were meted out to the athletic director and to the coach, I just think are disgusting in full, like across the board, full stop, the end. And if you just want to go to the letter of the contract, uh, that speaks to what should have been decided in regards to the the uh, standards that uh, the head football coach is placed under uh, because of domestic violence and the the right. obligation to report it and follow through on it. Exactly. You know, and it just yeah, you know, you're just I mean, and, you know, the other revelation talking about today or late, late last night that Urban Meyer was asking people about how to delete text messages from his phone from more than a year ago so that when he went, um, you know, those would not be available. So you obviously have direct tampering um, that was discussed. I'm not going to say that he did that, but, you know, when he met with the investigators, there were no text messages for more than a year ago. So logically if you're asking about how to do that because you want to get rid of those things and when you go to meet with the investigator those things do not exist the logical link is there i'm not saying exactly what happened because i was not there and you know legally i cannot say that however following the chain of logic of the events from the times that you know they were reported it seems to be very clear um and yeah again just like you talked about the verbiage in the contract you know said a certain thing the actions were different. Now, I don't know if, you know, the exact verbiage in the contract and obviously, you know, they, the, the people who decided things at Ohio State maybe did not have the foundation for firing Urban Meyer for cause. And obviously you don't want to fire somebody and then pay them $38 million because $38 million is hard to come by even at a very lucrative program with very, you know, probably rich boosters and things like that. However, you know, it just, again, it does not fit reasonable estimation of any reasonable person that he keeps his job regardless of your rooting interest period so the the two uh situations you just outlined that you cannot a hundred percent draw a conclusion but any reasonable person would make the conclusion would be yeah concerning the text message communication from shelly meyer to urban meyer everybody all of us thought the same thing when the story first broke that obviously this is a married couple and then as you mentioned it's even uh, reported based on just uh, storytelling throughout their their life together and his coaching that uh, they're they're close so uh, the magnitude we're not talking about can you stop by and grab uh, a gallon of milk at the grocery store kind of text we're talking about uh, the most weighty text you can imagine receiving number one and then the well, other conclusion that you just let me let me stop you right there again, uh, and just with the correction, the the text messages were from Courtney Smith to Shelly Meyer, sure. not from Shelly Meyer to Urban Meyer. So just wanted yeah, to. I, I'm sorry, I, I yeah yes exactly. Uh, and then the other um, point that you made that, that was a logical conclusion. Ah, uh, I, I lost text. it for deleting them. Yes, the the if you're asking about it, and then in fact they don't exist prior right. to August first of last year, that's a logical conclusion. Again, you can't say there there's it's a smoking gun. It's not you know you see the guy over the dead body and you see a, uh, he's holding a smoking gun. That's exactly what that means. It means that there is hardly any way you can feasibly imagine this person being lying on the floor dead for any other reason than the guy holding the smoking gun, but you didn't see the shot fired. Uh, the committee at the same time, or the, um, the investigative committee, they went to other conclusions and drew other conclusions that seemed to be a little bit more of a stretch in regards to Urban Meyer's good faith, uh, however they phrased it, his diligence in pursuing the matter, or uh, in another way, they, they, uh, his remorse and, and his um, also um, because of based on the decisions that he's made at Ohio State in reprimanding players that he has uh, that level of respect for women. So uh, I'm not denying those things, but again, those are um, 
those two statements, those various statements are, have a larger disparity between uh, uh, connecting the dots than do the two that you made in regards to um, showing guilt. Yep. All right. Didn't necessarily want to go down that path, but you raise a, a lot of good things uh, about uh, that situation. And um, that's uh, just a bit baffling uh, for a number of reasons. And, and I'm not the um, first guy that uh, goes to the table or goes to social media anytime that there is a, uh, a crime committed or a uh, law break broken. And then because somebody's uh, accused of it, I certainly want due process to follow through and, and um, so forth. So I'm not at the forefront of the court of public opinion to accuse and uh, convict somebody um, before it's been um, legally tried and determined. So I, I don't, I always uh, side on the innocent until proven guilty, but uh, uh, so that's where Zach Smith stands because none of those acts, at least the recent ones weren't, uh, necessarily proven after they were investigated, but the the Urban Meyer situation and doing due diligence uh, based on his job description and just moral obligation, uh, he didn't meet those standards uh, by any stretch. All right, uh, Cam talking uh, Miami football. So two things hit me. One was based on the chat here. Uh, somebody called your defense the most complete in college football. Now, obviously, you don't have a first-hand knowledge of every defense in college football, but are you happy with the defense uh, from a depleted defensive line compared to what you had last year with some of the great playmakers up front, R.J. McIntosh in particular, all the way through the secondary? Excuse me, yeah, um, that's a good question. Uh, I spoke about this on the radio today. I think that there are the bodies in the building to replace the guys who were lost. I think there is enough talent. Obviously, you have a Gerald Willis III, who was a five-star recruit uh, years ago. Now he's back after a leave of absence. He hasn't basically played in almost two full calendar years. Um, so that's a guy who can step in and replace, you know, Kendrick Norton, RJ McIntosh, or some of the production there. Uh, you have progression from Pat Bethel. You have Tito Odenigbo, Odenigbo, however you say it, uh, transfer from Illinois, um, who's actually, you know, been very good throughout the fall. Um, you have Nessa Silvera, you have, um, excuse me, somebody else at defensive tackle whose name I cannot remember right now. Um, John Ford, I think I said, Nessa Silvera, T you know, those guys. So you have five defensive tackles. Um, you have a bunch of pass rushers. Scott Patchen back on defense, uh, finally healthy again. He's a guy who's battled some injuries at Miami, looking like he can be a contributor. Joe Jackson and John Garvin already, uh, you know, your starting defensive ends. Demetrius Jackson, who's back after ending the year with a knee injury a little early, um, a couple of games early last year. He could play outside and inside, probably your best run defending um, defensive lineman. So, yeah, I think that there are bodies up front. And from an individual coaching standpoint at defensive line, Jess Simpson has uh, worked in college. He's worked in the NFL. And other coaches from those levels used to go to, to his high school when he was working in Georgia to learn more about defensive line. So I'm not going to say it's a one-to-one -one replacement for Craig Kuligowski because I say and I believe that Craig Kuligowski is probably the best defensive line coach in America. But it's not a far drop-off. If, I mean, it's probably negligible at best going to Jess Simpson. So from an individual coaching standpoint, I do believe that the players are going to have proper progression in coaching. Additionally, the overall defense, the scheme is to get up field, be disruptive. So that comes from Manny Diaz with the X's and O's up front or from the top down. So I think that, you know, they're, the guys up front are going to be put in a position to be successful. And I think that, you know, there's the talent to be successful. Obviously, Miami's linebacking situation is one of the best in America. Um Romeo Finley now looking like he's going to be the starter at striker um, in front of Zach McLeod. Um, but Zach McLeod started for two years. So that's another guy with starting experience. Uh, Romeo uh, Finley was a former safety. He's now playing that hybrid striker position, which, you know, against teams that, you know, spread it out a little bit more. You have a little bit more athleticism. Shaq Quarterman is a second team All-American by pretty much every single uh, publication that is released to preseason All-American team. Uh, Michael Pinckney is one of the best playmakers on the defense, uh, super underrated coming out of high school. But, you know, he's just been making plays for two years. Um, you know, so I'm, I feel very strongly about that top five group. Uh, if you put in like maybe a, a Mike Smith, who's the backup uh, to both uh, Pinckney and Quarterman. 
So, yeah, I mean, those five guys at linebacker, that's a very strong room. Obviously, Miami has uh, three very good linebackers uh, are committed to this recruiting class coming up for 2019. So, you know, if and when those, uh, you know, now juniors who started as freshmen and sophomores decide to leave to go to the NFL or they're out of eligibility, there will be troops to replace them which, you know, is a thing that Miami is getting into with having higher rated recruiting classes. And then there's all kinds of talent in the secondary. Mike, uh, Michael Jackson uh, is one of the best cornerbacks in America. Uh, big dude is 6'1", probably 205. Uh, had a really breakout season last year. You know, he's a new father with a, a young child and everything. So, you know, he's playing for a career to provide for his family, and he's elite. Jaquan Johnson's a first-team All-American by pretty much every single entity that has released uh, a preseason All-American group. I think the uh, – the Athletic is the only one that listed Quan Johnson as a second teamer, not a first team All American. So I mean, again, that guy was the franchise, and I said I've said it on this channel and I was talking to you for years. He was a four team first team, a four time first team All Miami Dade player at the biggest classification in football in Florida high school football. That's unheard of. It's literally a handful of people who have ever been four times first team All Dade County because of the talent that's there. you Most players don't even play varsity their freshman year. He played varsity and was a standout his freshman year all the way through. Comes in, you know, uh, just a great player, really finally, you know, progressing all the way through. He's an elite player, could be the best safety in all of college football. He's in Miami secondary. His very close friend, born at the same hospital on the same day, is Sheldrick Redwine. They played together growing up the entire way through. Redwine used to play corner, but I think he's found a home at safety opposite Johnson. And that pairing of safeties is one of the best in America. So you have three guys in Jackson, Johnson, and Redwine who are at the top of their game. Now all the seniors, so they've seen a lot. They've been through a lot. They've been through the dark times and then, you know, the high points as well here. And then you have Trajan Bandy, who I said, you know, is a sophomore down or through and through hurricane finally got his offer a couple years ago uh committed pretty much immediately he played a big role as a freshman he's gonna start probably outside javante dean like i said six two and you can run a sub four four forty if you have any kind of skill to go with that athleticism boom gilbert frierson um he's gonna be really good he's a freshman dj ivy gervin hall amari carter we got guys back there. Now, some of those other guys, after the first three, they don't have the game reps and things like that, like I was talking about. But it's taken me a couple minutes to go through every position group on defense. But from, you know, the line to the intermediate uh, level with the linebackers, the second level with the linebackers, and then, you know, to the secondary, Miami has the players across the board. Now, obviously, they have to have develop the skill and, you know, uh, make the plays and not make any mental breakdowns in the game. But I'm very confident with where the scheme of the defense is. I'm very confident where the talent of the defense is. Obviously, we need to tweak some things because at the end of the year, teams kind of figured out uh, a couple weak spots on the defense. And the last four games, I think Miami gave up 72% completions, which is unsustainable, obviously, as you can see by the results in those last four games, uh, three of the last three of which were losses. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, obviously there needs to be tweaks and things like that. But I think that my, Manny Diaz is, you know, getting to where the defense is fully where he wants it to be from a personnel standpoint. I think that he's able to do some really great things, including like he, Manny Diaz is one of the best in America at cornerback blitzes and safety blitz or defensive back blitzes. And like I said, when you have guys like that, when you have talent like this, then I think things should be good. So yeah, from a scheme standpoint and a personnel standpoint, I'm very confident with where Miami's defense is. I hope that we are as opportunistic with turnover luck this year as we were last year because turnovers are largely luck and there's math to support that. And I know that people, you know, say, oh, no, it's blah, blah, blah. look, the numbers support the fact that it is random to an extent with turnovers. Uh, but Miami trains for those to try to get those with their ball skills in the secondary and, you know, the rip and strip uh, up front. So, you know, hopefully those things stay the same. But, yeah, I'm in a very good spot with the defense right now. We're 10 days away from Miami LSU. If we get Cam Underwood on the line from State of the U, please join him right there for the very best in Miami football coverage as the Canes get set to defend their Coastal Division Championship and make it back to the ACC Championship game. Uh, Cam, one thing that came to mind for me, uh, I always like these kind of conceptual type questions. Uh, maybe I'm miscategorizing this, but uh, if you look at the number of plays that should be run by the Miami offense, all things being equal, that it's a very competitive game, score in the mid to high 20, something in that range, and the pace of play is what we would expect it to be. Let's say, and correct me if I'm wrong, let's say Miami runs 80 to 85 plays. 
and they throw, they want to throw 28 or 30 passes. They want to run it 45 or 50 times. I would love to know what you anticipate to be the running back distribution in terms of carries. Yeah. Um, I think that those plays might be a little, a little high. high. Yeah. yeah um, just in general, because I'm trying to get to the game. There we go. Game log. So last year, Miami ran, let me see, we ran more than 70 plays only four times. Um, Florida State, Georgia Tech, Syracuse, and North Carolina, 73, 74, 75, which was a season high in 73. Other than that, yeah, I mean, you're going to run 58 plays against Virginia Tech, which is kind of crazy when you think about how that game went, uh, and then in the 60s. So, uh, yeah, so you're talking like a play per minute, maybe a little bit, I mean, about, give or take, 840 Sorry, I got to do the math. So we got that. Third. 65 plays a game is what Miami averaged last year. So, yeah. So if you're talking, you want to be 35 or 40 run plays, um, you know, I think that you're going to have 18 to 25 for Travis Homer. Uh, you're going to have another 5 to 10 for Rozier because he does add that QB run element. And then you're going to split them up between DJ Dallas. Um, who's the number two running back and off, he's a slash offensive weapon, you know, wildcat quarterback, slot receiver, returner, punt returner, kick returner, uh, running back. Um, you know, he can play pretty much everywhere. Um, so he's going to get some snaps a game. And then Trayon Gray um, has really been a revelation this fall um, at the running back position. And also, you know, he can play single back, he can play fullback, um, a role similar to what, um, Najee Davenport did uh, as a junior and a senior at Miami. You know, he started as a running back and he's a bigger dude, you know, 6'2", 235 when he played. Uh, and then, he, you know, he played fullback because Miami was loaded back, you know, 2001, 02, uh, and then played some single back because, you know, he had the skills for that and even played single back in the, in the NFL for many, many years. Uh, and so I think that uh, Chuck Ray, his – his ceiling, I think, is that kind of a thing. But, yeah, I think that he's going to get some carries. Um, and then you have Lorenzo Lingard, who, you know, is a five-star uh, freshman, a five-star recruit. He's the most talented recruit uh, that Miami signed this last year. Uh, and he fell down the depth chart a little bit because of some struggles with pass protection, which we know at this level really matters. So I would say half-ish of the carries a game, um, maybe a little bit over, so half to maybe 60% will go to Homer, then, you know, another five to 10. So we're talking maybe another 15, 20% to um, Rogier. And that leaves you, you know, the other 20 or so percent, 25% splitting between uh, Trey, uh, DJ Dallas, Treyon Gray and Lorenzo Lingard. So um, it's a, a good problem to have where Miami has so much talent that it's going to be an interesting balancing act for Thomas Brown to get everybody the ball. But yeah, I think that that's how it's going to play out. Got Cam Underwood on the line from State of the U talking up the Canes with LSU on tap. Of course, a much anticipated game we've been waiting forever, and it's a Sunday night affair after most of the college football is going to be in the books. And uh, that uh, little rival there to the north, uh, Tallahassee, is going to be the host of a Monday night game with Virginia Tech in town, a very important ACC game right out of the shoot. Uh, Cam, so... The, the chat is reminding me, not that they're yelling at me saying, hey, Mark, ask this, ask this. But the rhetoric within the chat is reminding me of a point that I wanted to hit on a number of times. Considering what happened last year, considering both good and bad, going to the ACC championship game, winning the division, also considering the amount of talent and being the overwhelming favorite. It seems as though almost whether it's a Miami fan or on the other side, a Clemson fan, but we'll take the Miami group. Uh, you have a large amount of the fan base just skipping the season, talking about how are we going to get ready for Ellis or uh, for Clemson, talking about just, just basically with the assumption that you're going to win the division and you're going to line up against Clemson again in the ACC championship game. And what's that going to look like? Uh, I see it every time we we do a Miami uh, live stream on the chat. Just people talking about Clemson. How do we match up about against Clemson? That being a constant thought. Yeah, I mean it's it's good to think that way because you can't set low expectations and have high achievement, um, just in life or you know in sports. 
So looking at Clemson, because they're the class of the conference, they're one of, if not the best program in America, in, in America right now in college football. So we Miami should be looking at Clemson and trying to figure out how to how to get on their level. I mean, the last two times we played, Clemson beat, uh, beat Miami 93 to three. You know, um, that's not an engagement that I'm looking forward to repeating. So obviously um, the goal, I mean, the first goal is winning the, I mean, winning each game in front of you um, or a vast majority. Uh, so, you know, win the games on the schedule, win the division, you know, again, uh, which honestly Miami should because we're the most talented team and have a relatively easy schedule on the, you know, the path towards that. So that's number one. Number two is winning the conference, which is, excuse me, means you got to go through Clemson. And I see that you have the helmet in the background there on your setup. But yeah, it that is a reasonable goal. That is a thing that Miami has to figure out how to do. Because the last two times, like I said, Miami has been unable to do so. And the last time was in the ACC championship game. So you have to beat that team to get that championship. Um, and, you know, like I said, Miami is not back until championships are won. I was really thinking of national, but I mean, if you're beating Clemson, who's a national championship favorite, that's the kind of championship where you can say, okay, Miami's back. If my, if, if both teams came in, let's just say both teams came in 12 and up to the ACC championship game. And Miami wins that game, regardless of how it is, whether it's one point or by a million over Clemson and everybody, you know, we used to all make uh, jokes about Clemsoning and how they figured out a way with very, you know, top end talent to not have that production. But Clemson now has eschewed that they're a premium program and you beat them. That's a positive step forward. Um, and then, you know, you make the playoff, obviously, at 13 and 0, and then you let the, the chips fall where they may. Now, I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, but that is the viewpoint and the desire and the plan. So, yeah, Miami should be looking that way. I think that the offensive line, which has been better by reports um, throughout the fall, needs to show that again progression and performance in games against other teams and then against clemson really has to step it up because they whipped us last year up front it was terrible um you know malik rozier had no time uh even when he had time you know then he kind of was seeing ghosts because he was thinking oh my god one of these big dudes is going to come around the corner and all those big dudes are back again so yeah i mean the offensive line i mean clemson's defensive line is probably the best single unit in america of any from any team full stop so yeah Obviously, matching up against them, Miami's offensive line is not the best in America. I think it can be decent, but when you're going up against the best, and I mean, they have five stars from this past recruiting class who are playing third team. Xavier Thomas was like a top five recruit. Um, there's another kid. I forget his name right now. He's a top 20 recruit. Five stars, both of them. They're playing third team. You know, that's the kind of depth they have on defensive line. So that's kind of concerning. Linebacker, okay. If there's a weakness on a Clemson's team, it's going to be in the secondary. Now, Miami has the athletes to take advantage of that, but does the offensive line give time to Rozier, and does Rozier have the accuracy to now take advantage of those things? Because even last year, Jeff Thomas on that play-action play was butt-naked wide open. I mean, backflips and cartwheels down the field. I mean, he was unguarded because – he has that kind of talent and he, you know, call or we dialed up the proper route combination. Boom. He came butt naked wide open, but there was no time and Malik Rozier threw it late and missed him, you know? So that's where you're going to have that on offense. You know, we made Kelly Bryant need to hit throws to, to beat us. And he was pitch perfect hitting all of the underneath and check down receivers. And then, by the time it was 28 to nothing, because he's doing that, opening up lanes for the run game. Now Miami was just out of it because like I said, at the end of last year, teams had figured out what Miami was going to do. And the players did what the coaches told them to do, but the opposing scheme just took full advantage of the, the, the open areas, if you will. So seeing that um, come in a better way. And I don't think that if Miami makes it to the ACC championship game against Clemson, I don't think that we see Kelly Bryant because I think that Jake Lawrence, or not Tyler, Trevor Lawrence, excuse me, they're all world freshmen. I think that he wins that job. If not from game one, then Kelly Bryant's on borrowed time because that kid is the prototype 6'6", 215 pounds. He can throw the ball a mile. Um, Miami offered him as a high school sophomore, Trevor Lawrence, that was. And I looked up his film, and I was like, oh, my goodness. Like, I mean, he had 4,000 yards passing with, like, 40 touchdowns and three interceptions as a high school sophomore. 
I mean, in Georgia. I mean, like this is that. So I don't even think that we'll see Kelly Bryant again. But I say all of that to say Miami has areas where they match up well with Clemson. Like I said, linebacker is a very good group for Miami. The secondary, I know that Clemson calls themselves wide receiver U now because their top guys do go to the NFL and all kinds of things like that. Sure, Miami has a secondary to combat that. Miami's defensive line, I think, can be a problem for anybody's offensive line if things are going well and obviously without injuries. So I think that, you know, there's that. But obviously you need to do that against Clemson because Clemson's playing, uh, you know, pinball scoring against Miami the last two times we played. Uh, on the other side of the ball, you know, like I said, going up against Clemson's defensive line is going to be the story of the game, but there is a talent to match up with their defensive backs and take advantage of that advantage that Miami would have. So um, for everybody having a view of Clemson and saying that's where we need to go, that's who we need to figure out how to beat, everybody's saying that. I mean, Florida State's been saying that even when Florida State was good recently. You know, and even last year, they're trying to figure out, hey, how are we getting on Clemson's level? Louisville, hey, if we're going to beat anybody, we need to beat Florida State. We need to beat Clemson. Miami, look, all these other teams, they don't have the talent that we do. They don't have that. And and we have better players. I think we have better coaching. And we should be able, Miami, to take advantage of that in the coastal side, which means if we handle our business there, we're going to run into Clemson. So everybody who's saying, look, we need to figure out how to beat Clemson. How do we line up against Clemson? What can we do against Clemson? That's where your brain should be. I'm not saying it should be 100% there because I'm not overlooking anybody. You know, Florida State fans are talking about the Miami game on, excuse me, October the 6th. They open with Virginia Tech. I've not heard word the first of, from a Florida State person talking about Georgia Tech, or sorry, Virginia Tech. I'm not overlooking anybody. We start against LSU. That is a talented team. I don't necessarily think that Ed Orgeron is a good coach. I don't necessarily think that he's going to have this job in 365 days because Miami should beat them. And then, you know, they should lose other games along that way. That being said, Miami still needs to do that. So right now, focused on LSU. Intermediate term, focused on Florida State. Long term, I'm focused on Clemson. And I think that you can have those different levels of viewpoint and expectations. So I think it is a good thing that everybody is saying, look, we need to get on Clemson's level. We need to figure out how to recruit uh, as well as they do, how to have the player progression that they have, how to have the performance on the field that they have. That's a great thing. That, but that's your long-term goal. So, yeah, you know. Short term, LSU, intermediate term, Florida State, and the rest of the schedule, you know, Florida State and then the rest of the schedule, obviously. So we win that division. And then Clemson is the long term, uh, quote unquote, long term for the term of the season. Um, you can call that maybe short term, depending on how long your viewpoint is going to be. But yeah, it's a good thing to have one of the premier programs on performance in the sites to say Miami needs to get there and that's when Miami gets there on Clemson's level and beats Clemson, then that will show that our program has come back to the state that we, uh, you know, greatly hope and desire it to be. So I'm fine with everybody looking at Clemson, but don't only look at Clemson, even though that's a thing that you should look in the, you know, the future to see. So there's a handful of programs in the country that can look forward to a conference championship game, I think. And, and we all know who those teams are and based on Miami's talent, what they accomplished last year and based on the competition in the division, they could fill in that blank, even though I don't believe that, well, last year's team was not elite. We'll wait to see what happens with this year, but they certainly have an opportunity to rejoin the elite. Okay. The, the, the reason I brought up the topic, the spirit of the, the topic was not that Clemson shouldn't be the, the aim and the standard considering what happened last year, both good and bad, coastal division favorites, and that's the goal. No no issue there with it, the goal. It's just that I, I just felt a little disappointed. I felt a little bad for those fans who basically are writing past the entire season of 12 games. Let's just let's just enjoy week to week. Who's up next? Especially LSU. If it was Appalachian State, I'd say fine, look past them. But I would even say just enjoy the first game. Watch the first game. Take it in. I just read it more from a, well, we just can't wait to get to Clemson. We just need to get to Clemson. Let's. I can't wait to get there. <laughs> just to enjoy the season. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, like you talked about at the top. We've been without college football for a long time. So when it's back, you know, enjoy it while we have it. You know, one of my favorite quotes is, you know, the road is the thing, not the end of it. Travel too fast and you miss what you're traveling for. So, yeah, enjoy the journey, man. I mean, this is, again, a good team. We have a marquee game. Uh, 
the first of many, you know, really top end marquee, not even the first because we played Notre Dame the last couple of years and we played other, you know, great out of conference games before that. So another top end out of conference game, you know, it's a prime time Sunday night, only game going on in America, a premium location against another national brand uh, for LSU. Um, yeah, man. You know, so like, yeah, you know, don't, don't just try to rush to the end all of a sudden for no good reason. I mean, I know, you know, I just had a birthday and, you know, I'm a little older than I used to be, you know, and everything. But, yeah, you know, when you're a kid, you're like, oh, I want to be a big, you know, I want to be grown up eventually. And then you realize, dude, I got to work all the time. and You know, my paycheck's almost spent before I even get it because I got all these bills that I got to take care of and everything. And you're like, man, I wish I would have just enjoyed that time that I was in middle school, high school, college, just, you know, carefree and rebel and all that. Do the same thing with college football season, man. I mean, like, the end is going to be here. And then everybody's like, oh, man, I miss football. And it went so fast. So enjoy the journey. We have great games. We have a great home schedule. You know, LSU to start. You have Florida State at home down here in Hard Rock Stadium looking to win at home against them for the first time since 2004, I want to say. It's been forever since we've seen a win here in South Florida against the rival team. So that's going to be a major thing. You know, Boston College on a Friday night. You have another home game on a Thursday night. So you're going to have premium games all the way throughout. You know, if everything, you know, holds all the way to the Florida State game, there's no other game that weekend that is a premium game such as this. So that could be another Miami, uh, Miami Hurricanes host game day kind of thing, which was electric and awesome last year. You're going to have, you know, great recruiting business along the way. You're going to have hopefully players um, – playing to their potential, like Amon Richards reinserting himself into the national conversation. You're going to have new faces who step up in all these different kinds of things. You're going to see some great plays, you know, all, all across the board. You know, you remember Jaquan Johnson's one-handed interception against uh, Virginia Tech last year and those black jerseys spinning and running up the field. You remember all these different things? Yo, there's going to be plays like that this year. Don't take those for granted. Enjoy all of that. And then at the end of the season, with Miami hopefully handling their business, winning the Coastal Division again, and then getting to Clemson. Now we can reset and focus on that now, but don't speed to the end. Enjoy it, because Miami should be beating teams to sleep this year. We should have games, and Mark was talking earlier, oh, Miami scores, you know, mid-20s and everything like that. That's going to be a no. Like, that's not the expectation. Miami has the talent to score, you know, 35, 40 points a game across the board because they have that kind of talent. Don't you want to see that? Don't you want to see this team that we suffered through with Al Golden getting blown out a million to zero and all these different kind of things? Don't you want to see that team now not be the nail but be the hammer? I want to see that, bro. I'm here for that. I'm enjoying all of that. So every step along the way, I'm going to enjoy it. And then when we get to Clemson, we'll deal with Clemson because they're going to be out there. So, hey, Clemson fans, I know that you're, some of you guys are probably watching. Hey, come the first weekend in December, we'll talk. But right now, LSU, you're on the clock. And then we got teams after that. Savannah State, Toledo, uh, Florida State, everybody else. But I'm enjoying this journey. And I urge you Hurricanes fans to do the same. Oh, that was beautiful. Thank you. Well stated. All right. So that was my spirit of bringing up that topic. I just thought, man, just enjoy it. Just enjoy it. And and Cam explained it. And he pretty much explained exactly what was up here and in my heart is just even if it's uh even if it's Virginia week or Syracuse week, like it was last year, whoever it is from the the other division, Boston College and Florida State, they're gonna be difficult games in the other division but regardless and then my only other point and then i'll let you go cam is uh you brought up the kelly bryant trevor lawrence scenario at quarterback for clemson my only thought there is what's going to be fascinating possibly is if clemson's off to what we would expect to be an eight no start let's say and kelly bryant is very pedestrian does Dabo sweeney pull the plug on an undefeated team and make the quarterback switch thinking yeah we know we're going to win the division, or maybe even the ACC with Kelly Bryant at quarterback, but we know what the end game is and our ultimate goal. And to get there, we need to get the kid ready for the ultimate prize and get him that five games or six games. That'll be an interesting dilemma to see play out if it happens that way. Yeah, I don't think that even because I mean, you're, you're really talking about the same kind of scenario that Miami had last year with Malik Rogier, where obviously throughout the year, the performance was not elite all the way through, but the team kept winning games, even in spite of kind of poor performance at times. Um, I don't even think that it's going to get as far as a no before that's a conversation. I mean, the clock on Kelly Bryant starting, 
I mean, the expiration date is coming up very, very soon. I don't know if it's going to be game one or it's going to be game three or four, but I don't see it going eight games even. I really honestly don't. Trevor Lawrence is, you know, a generational kind of talent. He's the talent. He's way better of a prospect than Kelly Bryant is. And if the difference in performance is negligible, which I, from all the reports, because I've been, I've been reading a lot of stuff about Clemson. I've been following them because obviously, you know, they're a program that we go, you know, and we face, or hopefully we'll face in the championship game scenario and things like that. Similar to like I read about Florida State because that's a team that we compete against. I mean, it's not like Lawrence is fourth or fifth team or anything like that. Like he was in for the spring. He came in early. He played well then. You know, he's continuing uh, all that kind of thing. So yeah, I don't, I think it's going to be a handful of games, not two handful of games. It won't get to eight, I don't think. Um, but yeah, I mean, just the even in the short term, as a freshman versus a senior, I think that the performance level for Trevor Lawrence will be higher than Kelly Bryant. Because quite honestly, Kelly Bryant was not very good. Um, I think his best game was against Miami because, uh, you know, down a couple bodies and like the scheme, obviously they just figured out how to combat that. But Kelly Bryant's kind of average at best. I mean, he's 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 Jack. He's just a guy. But Trevor Lawrence is like that dude. He's not just a guy like he's that that guy. Um, and, yeah, I think it's going to be sooner rather than later. Uh, and I think that everybody knows that. And I think that even even though he won't necessarily like it or admit it, I think that Kelly Bryant knows that, you know what I'm saying? Like he's not living in a vacuum, you know, like, okay, cool. He was able to beat out Hunter Johnson, who was a five-star recruit from Indiana. Um, and then he J Johnson left and he went to Northwestern. So he's going to sit out this year. He's going to be closer to home. You get a better education because a Northwestern education is phenomenal. Um, and then you're playing in the big 10, you're a little closer to home and things like that. And, you know, obviously he's going to be the most talented kid on the roster where that wasn't the case, you know, in Clemson, but could Hunter Johnson have eventually overtaken? Sure. Zarek Cooper? Sure. But Trevor Lawrence is that guy. I mean, like he's, yeah, I mean, he's like, he's a different player than Deshaun Watson, but that kind of caliber of player um, where it's not if he starts as a freshman, it's when. So I think it's going to be sooner rather than later. Um, and, you know, for all of the talk of Clemson being wide receiver you and, you know, everything like that. I think when you have Trevor Lawrence out there, I think that the receivers across the board are going to see success that they haven't even seen because, you know, Deshaun Watson ran for 1100 yards one year uh, before he ran for 700 his second year, things like that. I mean, but you're not going to have those kind of rushing numbers from Trevor Lawrence, which means you take those numbers away. Maybe you give a couple, few of those rushing yards, maybe a hundred or two uh, to the running backs, but the rest of that's going to be passing because Lawrence wants to throw the ball. He wants to throw like deep. And so you have Justin Ross who had the nasty one handed catch that Clemson social media put up. Uh, that was crazy. You have all these guys on that roster. You're going to really push that ball down the field. It's going to be a different big play offense from a throwing standpoint with Lawrence. So yeah, I think it's going to be uh, just a matter of time. If not the opener, I don't see that Kelly Bryant is starting by October the 1st, honestly. Please like, comment, and subscribe right here for the best discussion in college football insight uh, from uh, the best bloggers, broadcasters, and writers around like Cam Underwood from State of the U. Join him right there, State of the U, for Cam and the rest of the crew covering Miami sports across the board. Football, of course, front and center with LSU coming up in 10 days. Go to it, Cam. Yeah. Um, the last thing that I want to say, and I know that, you know, I usually do my website plug at the end, but, you know, Mark did a great job you know, with that. And I hope that you are, uh, you know, reading State of the U because we do have comprehensive Miami Hurricanes coverage across the board. Um, and we do we have a great team uh, of writers and contributors. So we, we're doing a lot of great things. But speaking of that, I hinted at a couple of things the last time I was on or I hinted at something. And that's finally come to fruition um, for the last few months. Uh, I was working on a feature called The Recruiting Rules, where we looked at, or I, with uh, the help of some other recruiting writers and analysts, looked at what teams do, what are the traits and things that they do to recruit championship caliber rosters. So everybody knows that you want to have the blue chip ratio that Bud Elliott, my colleague, coined. You know, more than 50% of blue chip recruits on a team. But other than wanting that, how do you get that? Um, so I put together a really great piece. I got, I think it was 11 different uh, recruiting writers with more than 100 years combined experience following and covering recruiting. And I left the link up on the front page of the website. It's still pinned up there. Uh, 
great graphics by our guy, Mike Meredith. Um, it's called The Recruiting Rules. There are nine different installments. Um, and I, I talk a lot about it. I've been I've been blogging for about eight years now. So, you know, with on top of my experience, you know, in and, you know, I've worked in high schools. I'm close to the recruiting thing. Um, there are other you know people out there who do more individual interviews with recruits than I do. Um, but that's fine. It's OK. Uh, I could do that if I wanted. But I, I like taking a global view of things. So I really, really, really worked hard on this, had some really great guys. Bud Elliott, uh, he contributed a couple of things, uh, both you know, in that uh, Go 90 series on uh, Payton, Mississippi. He had a quote about recruiting that I put in there. Um, Trevor, uh, sorry, uh, Tyler Donahue from 247 Sports, Andrew Ivins from 247 Sports, my good friend JT Wilcox from the Miami Sports Tribune, a couple local beat writers, uh, you know, who cover recruiting and, and preps and things like that as well. Uh, so put together, kind of, I think, a really dynamic thing. Um, you know, use a lot of their quotations. Obviously, I'm a Miami blogger, so I use some examples from Miami. Um, Manny Diaz, the coach, he had a couple things talking about recruiting in the media. Another couple coaches that I'd spoken to previously when I worked in a high school, uh, I didn't put their names in there because I didn't uh, go back and follow up and say, okay, can I use this quote that you gave me? So I used it as an anonymous source. And I know that that would uh, anger Will Muschamp, but Will Muschamp can be mad about an uh, anonymous sources. But again, uh, it's called the recruiting rules. I worked really hard on it. Uh, and that's what I was hinting at last time. I really hope that you guys do uh, go in and check that out. I worked really hard on it. And I think that it's a really great piece. Uh, I think it's a feature that we can refer to back uh, for many, many years because it does lay out kind of the landscape and the foundation of what teams do. Uh, to, to build their championship rosters. So uh, that's my last plug. I really hope that you guys check it out, the recruiting rules over on the front page of stateofview.com. Um, that was all me. I didn't have really any help other than doing the interviews uh, with the other analysts. So uh, whew, yeah, like I said, it, it was a long time uh, in, in, the, in the lab working on that. So please check it out and then, uh, you know, comment and, and write me. Um, you know, you can find me on social media at Underwood Sports at the State of the U. Uh, my email address is in the bio for both of those profiles, uh, or you can just leave a, uh, a comment on the site. Uh, but yeah, like I said, um, that's my first really big long read feature. Uh, and I hope that you guys enjoyed and, you know, just give me some feedback and let me know what you think about the recruiting rules. So please do that. I know that a ton of you, because when Cam is absent, you make us aware of that, that you want to hear from Cam. So this is a benefit to him, and it's going to be a benefit to you because you love college football, and by extension, most of you love recruiting, and you're going to learn not – you keep up with specific players or specific teams. This is going to, as Cam outlined, give you a broad perspective on the recruiting game and how it works and what you want and how you build a roster and all those things. So it, it looks it's, – it's outstanding. I've read Cam's work many, many, many times. Uh, and I'm not a recruiting guy, but I need to understand it based on what I do as well. Right. Uh, so I rely on guys like Cam to come on and talk about specific players and needs on teams. But in regards to understanding the approach for elite uh, programs and the, the player perspective and all that uh, is contained right here as I brush through the nine uh, part series, uh, it's all right there. Very good stuff. Uh, we've got a newsletter starting in week one of the college football season. It's going to be released that Monday. So uh, while you're emailing and commenting to Cam's work, uh, drop us a line at TV at Gmail, and I'll get you on the newsletter that uh, is to be released week one. All right, Cam. Man, you did a lot of work here. Uh, go uh, have a good uh, rest of your night. Uh, you've earned it. Yeah, man. You know, thanks. And I appreciate it. So, uh, you know, I, w I was absent last week. Um, I know Mark was reaching out to me because my birthday was last week, Friday, the 17th, um, the uh, annual day commemorating and celebrating the most awesome day in the history of the world uh, is what, you know, trademark uh, my birthday is called. So uh, thank you. Thank you to everybody uh, for that. Um, and honestly, you know, I'm here all the time. So it's always a great conversation. Be sure you check me out on social. Be sure you check out State of the U. We have a Facebook page. We have an Instagram um, you know, obviously the website, all those uh, state of the U, um, the state of the U, I want to say on social. Um, but yeah, you know, go check it out. We're going to be here for the Miami Hurricanes season. Um, and like we talked about earlier, enjoy the ride because it's going to be a good one. All right, Cam, we will see you soon. Thank Later, you so guys. much.